Amen. Please be seated. I'd like to invite you to take your Bibles out and turn to Ecclesiastes today. Uh, Let's look at Ecclesiastes chapter 3. I know I uh, preached a a few messages from Ecclesiastes last year, uh, several months ago, uh, in chapter 1. And I'm sure you remember every word that I said, and you just hung on every word. Uh, But today we're going to go to chapter 3. God impressed upon me a message out of Ecclesiastes chapter 3. And we're going to look at verses 9 through 15 today. We're going to start a brand new series entitled Gut Check. And uh, do you like the picture that we found for that? Lisa, pick that out. Um, You know what? Somebody said you can never go wrong if you use a child in in your sermon and and in your pictures and things. Um, You know, it looks like he's doing a gut check right there, isn't he? Uh, but the truth is sometimes we all need to do a gut check, a a, a gut check, just so you, you're for sure that you know what I'm talking about. I want to make sure it's, it's those moments in our life whenever we need to turn and look not at our belly buttons, but, but turn and search deep within ourselves. Uh, whenever we really have to just kind of suck it up and, and check in our, in our innermost uh, being and search deep within. Today we're going to talk about gut check and we're going to talk about uh, our eternity. Uh, Cody set it up very well. You did a good job because basically uh, we're going to be talking about eternity today or forever. You know, we, uh, we talk about forever and I think sometimes we uh, mess up because we define forever in, in the wrong terms. Um, how many of you have ever been on a trip somewhere at some point in your life uh, that you said this trip. We are, we are never going to get there. It is going to last forever. Anybody ever have that experience? If you've had children and traveled with children, you've said that before, I'm sure. Uh, when the kids start saying every five minutes, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? You think this is going to last forever. Uh, sometimes we, we term forever in a task that we have to do. Um, Have you ever had a task to do that was so overwhelming you thought, this is going to last forever. I'm never going to get this done. It's going to be forever. I just can't get this done. And in reality, that's not forever. You made it to your destination in your trip, or at least you could have. And and the task could have been done, probably. Or maybe you're in the midst of that right now and you think, I am never going to get through this. Maybe it's a troubled time in your life. We all face adversity. We all have trials. We all have troubles in our life. In fact, if I had a, a straw poll here, I'd say that 90% of you probably are going through some kind of trouble right now. And so whatever it may be, and I posted something on this last week, and everybody just flocked to it and liked it and shared it. It was basically about the fact that no matter where you're at in your troubles, you just keep pressing on, and you keep your eyes focused on the Lord, and sometimes we say this problem, this pain, this circumstances, these things are just going to last forever. And in reality, they won't. And then sometimes we deem and classify forever in someone who likes to talk. I was thinking about that. Have you ever been around somebody who you had a conversation with and they went on and on and on and on and on And you thought, this person is going to talk forever. I've got to get out of here. How can I get away from this person? They're going to drive me crazy. Now, some of you can deal with that and relate to that. And some of you are the ones that do that. So just realize, we have other things to do. I can't talk forever, you know. We can talk for a while. We've said that before, haven't we? I think this person could talk forever. So we talk about forever in the terms of traveling and in in terms of of a task to do and in in terms of troubled times and in terms of of talking. But the truth is, it will end someday. No matter what, it will end someday. But when we talk about forever and eternity and I look at it in the Word of God and I look at it by God's terms, forever has a whole different meaning than some of the things that we deem forever here on this earth. Our eternity. And the question comes to my mind, why do so many people go through this life ignoring the reality of their eternity? Now, we like to think that we think about our eternity even as believers. 
Even lost people think that they are prepared for eternity, many of them, and they're not. But so many times in our life, day by day, week by week, year by year, we go on and on and on, and we really pay no attention to our eternity. We ignore it. We don't want to think about that. And many people go through this life ignoring the reality of their eternity, their forever. And you may be think, you may think you're in a conversation that lasts forever. You may think you're in a circumstance that lasts forever. You may think that you're on a trip that's going to last forever. You may think that you're in a task that lasts forever. But in reality, forever is forever in God's terms. So today I want to take the Word of God and look at Ecclesiastes chapter 3. And just to set the stage, I know you guys probably remember it because we were there not too long ago, but, but Solomon wrote the book of Ecclesiastes, King Solomon. And King Solomon, in all of his wisdom, all of his glory, all of his splendor, all the money he had, all the finances, he had everything at his disposal. And for some reason, Solomon began to wrestle with, uh, in the first part of the, the book of Ecclesiastes, he, he, he wrestles with the vanity of life. Everything is meaningless in life. I just can't get no satisfaction. Basically is what he was saying. And then you see, and in verses 1 through 8, it talks about there's a season for everything, a time for this, a time for that, a time for this, a time for that. And that's so very true. But then when you get down to verse 9 and where we're going to start at in Ecclesiastes chapter 3 today, you begin to see that Solomon seems to, to, to grapple, to, to wrestle with something different. And I believe that all of a sudden his eternity begins to click in his mind. It should in ours today. Let's all stand and we're going to read this together. And I want us to see what Solomon has to say in, this, in these verses. <coughs> In Ecclesiastes chapter 3, starting in verse 9, here's what Solomon says. He says, What profit has the worker from that in which he labors? I have seen the God-given task with which the sons of men are to be occupied. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity in, the, in their hearts, except that no one can find out the work that God has do, does from beginning to end. I know that nothing is better for them than to rejoice and to do good in their lives. And also that every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of all of his labor. It is the gift of God. I know that whatever God does, it shall be forever. Nothing can be added to it and nothing taken from it. God does it that all men should fear before him. That which is has already been. And what is to be has already been. And God, listen folks, God requires an account of what is past. Let's pray. Father, as we come to you this morning, we thank you, God, for your word. And I just stand upon your word today and I ask you, Lord, to speak to us through the reading and the, the spirit moving in your word, God. Father, I pray today that each and every one of us would wrestle with the thought of eternity, Lord. I know it's not a subject that we like to think about, that we like to talk about, but Lord, our eternity has such dire consequences without preparing, and that preparation comes through the saving grace of Jesus Christ. Father, I pray here today for someone who doesn't know Jesus as Lord and Savior, that they would not walk out of here without their eternity being prepared through the blood of Christ. Someone may be listening, someone may be watching, whatever it may be, God, Lord, move in their hearts today. Father, we love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. So today I want to look at the question and try to answer the question, what causes so many people to go through this life Ignoring their eternity. I would say probably this past week, there's most everyone have never even thought about your eternity. You had bills to, to pay. You had jobs to do. You had families to take care of. You had groceries to buy. You had all these things that you wanted to do, that you had to do, that you needed to do. And probably most people didn't really wrestle any with their eternity. Maybe didn't think about it one time. Maybe for a moment it glips into their mind and then all of a sudden it was gone again. And the reality is there's so many people that just completely ignore their forever. Their eternity. 
I would say that's a pretty important subject, wouldn't you? I think we better think about that today, and I think we better be sure that we answer these questions today. Why do so many people go through this life ignoring eternity? Well, the first reason are because sometimes people just don't stop long enough. Sometimes people just don't stop long enough. What do I mean by that? Look at verse 9. Verse 9, it says, What profit has the workers from that in which he labors? And verse 10 says, I have seen the God-given task with which the sons of men are to be occupied. You see, when God created us, He created us with a desire, a will, and a need to work. Now, you look at some people and you think, well, that desire didn't happen to hit them. It doesn't seem like work is very important to them, but you will find that even though it may be not a nine-to-five job or whatever it may be, there's still something inside them. They need to be doing something. God put that within us that we would have a desire to work and that we would be occupied. Now, the problem is there's so many people in this world that God created to work and to be occupied, but here's what happens. We get things out of order and we get things out of the parameters of what God has planned for us and we become overworked and overoccupied. We let the things of this world choke out the things of God and at that point we begin to work more than we begin to rest. We begin to be occupied and preoccupied more than we stop and think about our Creator. You see, everything in balance, God created us to work. I believe when we get to heaven, I'm not going to go too deep into this, but I believe when we get to heaven, God will have work and tasks for us to do. And this earth is preparing us for what God has for us to do when we get to eternity. So if you're going through something right now, it may be hard work. It may be that you're occupied with with a a lot of tasks, but it may be that God has a task for you when you get to heaven that is going to say, wow, I see what God is doing. And what he's done. You see, God created us to work. God created us to be occupied. But when we become overworked and overoccupied, we don't take time to stop and think about God. In fact, the way God created this world, he created us so that we would be, be busy and occupied and working six days a week. And on the seventh day of creation, what did God do? He rested. Do you think God got tired and he had to take a break? Do you think that God was so, so wore out, the Creator, who can speak things into existence? Do you think that He needed to say, you know what, I need to take a coffee break and kick my shoes up and rest for a while? God created the seventh day of rest for us. There's so many people in this world that do not take the time, set aside, to stop and to think about God on the Sabbath day. Now, we honor the Sabbath day, the holy day, as Christians on Sunday. How many people do you know of on Sunday that are so busy and so preoccupied that they don't take time to stop and come to church and worship God? You know, in reality, you know what they're doing? They're ignoring their eternity. They're not thinking about the things of God long enough to stop and think that there is something greater, something longer. No matter what I'm going through right now, I need to stop and begin to rest and begin to think about God in my eternity and I need to worship Him. It it was very evident to me in Hebrews chapter 10 that God wanted me to think about that and maybe share that today. I'm not going to read that to you today, but in Hebrews 10 it talks about not forsaking the assembling together. Many of you know that. What that basically means in a nutshell is, do not give up coming to church and stopping and thinking about God and and eternity and where you're headed to and to worship Him. But you look around and you say, where are all the other believers at? Where are all those that profess that their Jesus is their Lord and Savior and they don't take time to stop and think about God? Ronnie Smith had a post that I shared, and if if you're on Facebook, you can look at my post or his post about how can you call yourself a Christian and not want to stop and come together and worship God. The Bible says to do that. People don't want to stop. If believers won't stop to think about God, how can we expect lost people to do that? If somebody sees a Christian, a so-called Christian, and they say, I believe in Jesus, and they see you not going to church and and not coming together with other believers, you, you know the bottom line, you need me and I need you. 
How many times have you came to church and been encouraged by being around other believers? Anybody? I hope that you can do that. I hope that we do that here. I think we do a great job of that here. Coming together, assembling together, and building each other up, encouraging, that's what it says in Hebrews 10, and going out to face the world. You've got a whole week to face the world. Stop and come into church and worship God on Sunday. The problem is people are ignoring their eternity because they don't stop. They're overworked. They're preoccupied. There's no time for church and for God and things like that. Some people don't stop long enough. God gave us a balance of work and, and enjoyment and to stop and worship Him. You know, a few months ago, my wife, in a moment of weakness on my part, told me that we need to stop and get away. And so... She got this wild idea that we needed a Christmas break because she gets two weeks off at Christmas at, at school, that we need to just get away from everybody and everything and just go and enjoy. And I thought, wow, that sounds good. And all you got to do is give, give, give my wife one little hint of something, and she just takes it and runs with it. And so she found this vacation destination that we could go to. And I don't know that anybody missed us being gone, but we were gone for about a week. And we... Well, that's okay. I didn't miss you guys either, so that's all right. No, I'm just kidding. And so that's exactly what we needed to do. We needed to stop and rest because, and I don't want to have, I'm not having a pity party here, but when the preacher's at church, he's not always getting to stop and worship God because there's a hundred other things to be done. And so sometimes you got to pull away. And so that's what we did. She said, how about we go to Cancun, Mexico? Yeah, that sounds great. She showed me the price tag and I about choked to death on it. And I thought, you know, there's times in life where you just got to stop and do some things and get away. And so we did that. We, we scheduled that. And we left on New Year's Eve, or excuse me, New Year's Day. We were in St. Louis. And we walked out to board the plane. And it was 10 degrees below zero. And the wind chill was 25 below zero. And we're walking down that runway or uh, the, the tunnel to get on the plane. And we have to stand there before they'll let us on the plane. And I'm thinking Cancun and I'm not thinking St. Louis. And I got a light jacket on. I'm sitting there like this, just freezing, you know, 25 below. And we step on that plane and we sat down and you did, we just let everything go. And we stepped off that plane and it was 75 degrees. We went from 25 below wind chill to 75 degrees. That's 100 degrees warmer than what it was when we left. I was so glad that she talked me into stopping for a while. We showed up down there and we had decided one thing. We got an all-inclusive resort. And the reason why we did that was because I didn't want to do anything but just sit and do nothing. And that's what we did. We'd sat on the beach and we just enjoyed each other's company. And my wife told me, she said, I, get to, I have to share you all the time, Don, with everybody. She said, when we're down there, it's not going to be anybody but you and me and God. And so all I focused on was her and me and God. We had a great time down there. Our goal was to just stop. And, and I can tell you that God fed me while I was there. Why? Because I stopped and I began to think about God. I began to think about all He had done in my life. All he, when's the last time you did that? When's the last time you stopped and thought about God and, and your Creator and your Savior and your Lord and Jesus Christ and your eternity? Sometimes we don't do that. We don't stop long enough. I believe that there's millions of people that don't even stop to think about their eternity and they're headed for hell. The next reason why I think people go through ignoring eternity is because sometimes people just don't look far enough. They don't stop long enough, but they don't look far enough. You know, it's surprising what you can see when you stop. You begin to look around at all that God has done. Have you ever stopped and looked around at all that God has created? In fact, in verse 11, it jumped out to me. Here's what it says. He has made everything beautiful in its time. God has made everything beautiful in its time. How much do you enjoy the beauty of God and nature? To look around and see, and we talk about it all the time, about sunsets and sunrises and talk about nature. And some of you guys like to go out in the woods and, and just watch or go in, a, in the duck blind and watch, watch the ducks come in and things like that and geese and stuff. Or watch the deer, you know, and then just get to kill one.
We don't stop long enough and look far enough to see what God's done. You see, it's surprising to me how many times we don't look around and see the beauty of what God has created. Isn't it a shame that God has made so many cool things and we don't even pay attention? You see, the beauty of creation and of nature and animals and the ocean, guess what? I got to sit and look at the ocean. How many of you love or have, have had privilege and been able to sit and just look at the ocean? A lot of you, yeah. It is, doesn't it make you feel closer to God when you're at the ocean? Isn't it cool just to sit down in one of those chairs and look out as far as you can see and think, you know what? This goes on forever. I, I can't see the other side, and it just goes on forever. In fact, we were setting, and this is, this is where God gave me this message. Sorry, I'm taking a break here while I'm preaching. I was sitting at a pool in a lounge chair, and there was a long pool in front of me. And after that long pool, you could see the ocean. They designed it where you could see the ocean after that. And I'm sitting back in that chair and just enjoying lo the Lord and enjoying nature and looking at the ocean. I tell you, in Cancun, that water is blue, beautiful blue. And I'm looking out across there and I'm seeing the pool and then I'm seeing the ocean and I'm thinking, man, this just goes on forever. And then it hit me. That's exactly how we look at life. We are in a position in life where we look out and we see this pool and we think, man, this is just going to go on forever. But then you realize you can see the other side of the pool. So there's moments in your life when you look at things and you see the other side of it and you think, this is not going to last forever. I'm not going to be able to work forever. I'm not going to be able to do this forever. There's things that we see in that. But then you look out at your life and you look at the ocean and you think, wow, I just it goes on forever. How many of you believe that the ocean goes on forever? We know that it doesn't, right? We know the ocean doesn't go on forever, but we say, look at that ocean. It goes on forever. And what happens is people don't look far enough to realize that that's exactly how our life is. What we don't realize is I'm not going to live forever. Somehow we block in our minds like we say the ocean goes on forever. My life is going to go on forever. And the reality is somewhere is going to end on the other side. We don't know when, we don't know how. But somehow in our minds we think it's going to go on forever. You see, in verse 11, that's when it hit me. I, I, this message came to me while I was on the beach at the ocean, so I think the church should pay for me to go uh, to Cancun once a year to get messages. I think that'd be a good idea. All those in favor? Hey, i got a couple hands to raise up. How about I take you with me? No, now everybody wants to go, yeah, yeah, right, Bonnie, yes, yeah, okay. Look at verse 11. You see, some people don't look around. He made everything beautiful in this time. We don't look around and see what God has done. And then look, it's, it's buried right here in this verse. I want you to see this. Also, he has put eternity in their, what? In their hearts. Now, if you've got a King James Bible, it's going to say he's put the world in your heart. That word actually in the Greek is much better translated eternity. God has put eternity where? In your heart. So the reality of this is, is people ignore the reality of eternity and God has placed eternity in each and every one of your hearts. What does that mean? That God has put eternity in our hearts. Well, that means that God has put something deep down inside every single human being that they know that there's got to be more. They know they're going to die. They know that there's something out there past that. But so many people suppress it. They ignore it. They think this ocean of my life is going to go on forever. And they don't face reality. People go through their whole lives not thinking about what God has put inside them, and that is there is an eternity. How many of you believe in eternity? There, there are some people who suppress it so hard that they say, you know what, when I die, I'm dead and gone and nothing else. I just I go back to the earth and there is nothing else past that. That is a lie. 
It's just like Cody said whenever he was talking this morning. There is one of two places that everyone goes for their eternity. And God has put that in your hearts to know. You see, I sat by that pool and, you know, when you go to the beach, and I think you guys have talked like you've been there, there's some people who shouldn't really be dressing the way they dress at the beach. You got that? How many say amen to that? Amen. There's body parts exposed that shouldn't be exposed. There's things that I really don't even want to see. And some people think they got it and they don't got it. And they'd be better off, you know, to just you know, put a robe on or something, you know. I looked around at that beach and there was just something inside of me. And, and when I was thinking about that message, this message that I was going to speak to you, I was thinking about all the people. And there were hundreds of people there around the pool, around the beach. We went down to the beach and there's people there and they're laying out and they're sunbathing and, and some of them were drinking, you know, alcohol, things like that. And they just were having a whooping good, too good a time, really. And I couldn't help but think of how many of those people were ignoring the reality of their eternity. How many of those people were going through life and they were having a party? In fact, it says in here, in, where is it, in verse 13, that every man should eat, drink, and enjoy the good of all of his labor. It is a gift of God. Yeah, God wants us to enjoy life, to eat and drink and enjoy life, but I think they took that a little too far. They were eating and drinking and doing and all this stuff, and I looked at them, and I couldn't help but think the eternity that I read about in the Bible is in their hearts, but they've suppressed it so much that they don't realize that many of them, and I'm not judging, but judging by the looks of what they were acting and doing, many of them were going to die and go to hell. And that burdened me. And I got to thinking, there's a whole world full of people just like that. You know who they are. They're all around you. Sometimes people don't look far enough. They don't see that life is going to end somewhere. That's why they ignore their eternity. And then finally, and lastly, you know, sometimes people don't stop long enough. Sometimes people don't look far enough. But sometimes people don't fear God enough. Amen? Amen? They don't fear God enough. Now, there's things that you fear in your life. How many of you fear things in your life? Something you got that you fear in your life? Yeah, we all do. You come back tonight and Mike will help you with that. I'm not going completely that direction. He's talking a little bit about what he was going to talk about tonight. I think it's going to be good. You need to be here tonight for that. And by the way, a little plug, our journey group's going to start back up tonight too. So if you're a part of our journey group, some of you here, we're meeting tonight again, finally, after all the Christmas breaks and everything. And if you aren't a part of a journey group, you come join us, 6 o'clock tonight. And if you don't want to join us, join the adults as they study. There's a place for everybody here. Okay, now where was I going with that? Everybody is fearful of something. You know what your fear is in your life? You know what you fear the most? You know what I fear? I've told you this before. You know what I fear the most in life? I don't know why. It seems so stupid. I don't know why I can't get it out of my head. I am claustrophobic. Anybody here claustrophobic? Okay. I didn't realize how much I was. I think I got more claustrophobic the older I got. And I don't know how I did that, but I did. Do you know what I feared the most at that resort? Anybody got a wild guess? Elevator, yes. We were on the 19th floor. And I was like, oh no. 19 floors in that stinking elevator. And you know, 19 floors is a long way to walk. And so... We were at the hotel, and Lisa was downstairs taking care of some things, and she sent me back to the room. She needed some papers or something. And I, I get there, and there's like 50 people waiting to get on, on two elevators because the third one broke down. And when I see a broken down elevator, that scares me to death because I think I could be on that thing. It does, and that comes in my mind. And so there's 50 people, so when one elevator door comes open, it looks like the clown car. Everybody's piling and piling and piling in, you know? And everybody's piling in. I'm thinking, please, Jesus, just come back right now. So I get in that air, that elevator, and and sure enough, with all those people in there, we were all in here like this, and every single stop had to be made. One, two, three, four, five, all the way up to the top till I got to 19. And I feared for my life. 
And I close my eyes and I say, Jesus, please just get me through this. It, and you guys think that's silly? Uh, you tell me what your fear is and I'll make fun of you, okay? It's something I can't get over. You know, some people fear spiders. Daryl? Yeah. You know, Daryl Martin, you know, could wrestle a bear with his bare hands. And you get a little spider that runs by and he acts like a little schoolgirl. I tell you, I've never seen the like. A mouse, a mouse! No, a spider, a spider, yeah. Did you see in the news in California, there was a guy that was so scared of spiders. Now, this was a big spider. I had some kind of timber spider or something. I'm sure it's a big one. But it was in his apartment, and so he was so scared of that and wanted rid of it so bad, he took some kind of a propane torch and tried to burn it up. Did you guys hear about that? This is true. And he set that spider on fire trying to burn it up, and the spider took off running and caught his apartment on fire. And it burned his apartment and his other apartments too, and, and, he, and everybody had to move out of the apartment. Can you imagine that? Why is it that we fear so many things that are so silly here on this earth? A little spider... Stinking elevator. The Bible says that we need to fear God. Now that doesn't mean you have to be scared to death of God. It's talking about a reverent, holy, I will stand before God someday. In verse 14 it says that God does all this, that men should fear before Him. You should know that there's going to be a... You, you ever heard the sermon, Payday Someday? I think Billy Sunday preached an awesome sermon. Payday Someday. There will be a payday someday. H how about you rednecks? You, you watch um, the Midas commercial, I'll date you, whenever George Foreman would come out, and he'd say, uh, on Midas, he's, he could, he'd say, you can pay me now, or you can pay me later. He was talking about a muffler shop. The point they were trying to get is, you can... You can face reality today, or you can face it before God someday. You can choose right now, this very moment, to, to decide that I'm, I'm not going to ignore my eternity anymore. Now, now, for some of you, it looks a little different than others, because Cody said it very well. There's one of two places you will spend your eternity. Be very clear, the Bible doesn't say there's many roads to heaven. The Bible doesn't say there's more than one heaven. The Bible doesn't say that if you're a good person, you'll go to heaven. The Bible doesn't say that if you come to church, you'll go to heaven. The Bible says if you're saved by Jesus, you'll go to heaven. Yeah. And that's a reality that you need to face. Without Christ, your eternity will be in hell and damnation. How could God do that? God doesn't do that. He sent His Son to die so that you wouldn't have to face eternity in hell. But the reality is people ignore that. They say, I've got an ocean of life ahead of me when there's somewhere that's going to end. God's put eternity in their hearts, but they've ignored it. They've suppressed it. They're too busy working. They're too busy doing. They think they've got plenty of time. And people face the Lord without Jesus in their life. For those of us who are believers, you have nothing to fear when it comes to eternity away from God, but you do want to fear and respect the fact that God will call you into account for what you do with your life. Your salvation is secure in Jesus. Amen? Nothing can take that away, but when you stand before God, God will say, what did you do with my son and my salvation and my life that I've given you? You see in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, it talks about we will all, Christians will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ and give an account for what we've done. For the lost, they will say in, in Revelation chapter 20, I believe it is, that they will stand before the great white throne of God and that is the judgment of God on those who are condemned because they choose to be condemned, do not accept Christ. And at that moment, God will say, depart from me, I knew you not. And it talks about the lake of fire that they'll be cast into. You see, there's a reality here that too many people ignore. You know, I was on the beach and got to enjoy a lot of time with my wife and with the Lord. But on Thursday, we got a message that no one wants to receive. We were sitting there by the pool, enjoying all that God had created, enjoying each other. And my wife got the text message that her mom had died. And I saw my wife just 
collapse right there. And I consoled her, and I loved on her, and she was weeping tears. And I looked around, and I saw hundreds of people that were going about their day, enjoying the sunshine and the warm weather, totally oblivious to the fact that my wife had just faced the reality of eternity with her mother. How many times in life do we see people ignoring, not even knowing that someday they will face that same reality? How many people go through life and they don't understand that someday they will stand before God and if they don't have Christ in their life, they will stand convicted and judged by God? The reality was there that day. If you don't have Christ in your life and you're sitting here, you're listening, you're watching, face reality today. I can say it, I can cry it, I can scream it, I can preach it, I can show you in God's Word, but you have to face your own reality. You may walk out of here without Christ, you may turn the video off but the reality is still there Jesus died for your sins if you don't know for sure where you're going to spend eternity why would you gamble why would you bet why would you take a chance on something that's going to actually go on forever and ever and ever and ever and ever your eternity is at stake Jesus paid it all Believers, we owe all to Jesus. Amen? Amen? Are you living in the reality that someday you will stand before God? Someday you will stand before Him and give an account for what you've done with what God has entrusted to you. Maybe there's somebody here today in just a moment. You're going to have a chance to give your life to Jesus. And please, don't walk out of here without Him. <laughs> Maybe there's somebody here today that's a believer and... You haven't been given a very good account of what you're doing for the Lord. And you need to give your life back to Jesus and, 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 and give it to Him, rededicate your life. Maybe there's something standing between you and God. Maybe there's something that you're doing that you shouldn't be doing. Maybe there's something that, that you're ignoring that you need to face and say, God, I know that I'll stand before you someday. And I want to be completely prepared for eternity today. Are you ignoring your eternity? You can do that today. Or you can face the reality that Jesus saves. Father, I thank you, Lord, for this day. I thank you, Lord, for your son, Jesus. Jesus, I thank you that you died on the cross for our sins. I thank you that you were buried in a tomb. And I thank you, Jesus, that you raised three days later to new life. <laughs> Lord, we know that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that God raised him, you, Jesus, from the dead, that we will be saved and forgiven and loved and have eternal life with you. Father, help us to serve you. Lord, I want this church to be on fire. That your Holy Spirit would be moving here in this place in a way, Lord, that would call sinners to repentance and call the saints to stand up and shout, Jesus is the way. Don't ignore, ignore him. He's the only way. Father, we love you and we praise you. We give you all the honor and glory. Thank you for your indescribable gift of salvation. In Jesus' name, amen.